and I told myself at the very least, I'm going to have a story to tell. That seemed like a good deal for me. I had just gotten laid off from a giant insurance company, so nothing seemed like a sure thing, whether I was working for somebody else in a very secure industry or working for myself. It just kind of at that point, I'd lost this sense of I'm definitely going to be getting a paycheck. Welcome to the Revolution of One podcast, where the revolution will not only be televised, but also individualized. Today's guest is Steven Kars. Steven is the co-founder and CEO of King of Pops. Today, we're going to talk about his entrepreneurial journey, his ideas on how to deal with the fear of failure, and how to go from being an idea generator to being an idea executor. Steve, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Excited to be here. A lot of people on your team describe you as a guy who um, never walks into the building without a new idea. You've been described as someone who generates 100, I quote, 100 <laughs> ideas a week. That's an impressive statistic, man. Yeah. Is, is that true? What do you think of that? I don't know who's counting it, um, <laughs> but a lot of ideas coming into the building, uh, especially if I go somewhere to get inspired, whether it's a conference or mm-hmm. reading a book, uh, people are a little bit dreading those days, um, <laughs> kind of be so excited about what I just learned and I uh, I'll, I'll immediately think about how that could be applied to our business. Um, and sometimes that takes people too many directions. So yeah, definitely a lot of ideas, but um, trying my best almost 10 years in to um, realize an idea is easy and then the execution of the idea, not always easy. <laughs> now, are these like meta level ideas like, oh, I've got a, a new business venture we can start or are these sort of like operational ideas? Here's how we can improve customer service or... They, they tend to have a particular flavor or all over the place? Yeah, I'd say kind of all over the place. Yeah. I mean, um, the ones that are fun to talk about, I mean, in interviews like this are obviously like new business ventures yeah. or what a new product could be. But just as often it would be about um, how to motivate employees better or yeah. how, to, um, how to have work be more fun or more engaging. Um, just as many ideas on that as the other. I mean, i Everything from like thinking, I'll be at a conference and think like, man, we could create our own currency that people are getting these things within this revolving circle of businesses that we operate and that would be great. And then you come back and you tell that to someone and their eyes are glazed over and you're like, <laughs> oh yeah, like that might not be real. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's your inspiration? I mean, are, are you one of those people who you read a lot, you're constantly consuming content, do they just come to you naturally, meditation? Where do you generate these creative ideas? Yeah. I read a lot. I mean, I actually, I mean, if we're going to get into, I listen a lot. Um, mm. I read probably four books a year, but I probably listen to 40 books a year, mm. um, which is just kind of when I'm, I travel a lot. So yeah. instead of having the radio on, I just have a book on and sometimes I'll be paying hundred percent attention and sometimes I'll be paying 35% attention. So I think that's a lot of ideas. Um, and then I think the difficult part about that is just like, how are you curating that list? Who are the people that um, are kind of saying you should read this? Because the algorithms are decent in like Audible and on Amazon and Kindle and stuff, but they're certainly not perfect and they become kind of repetitive. So you have to, just like when you're making a Spotify list, like if you keep going with only, I don't know, classic rock, you're never going to hear like these other 10 genres that are super important as well. So try to kind of make sure I'm getting a varied um, source of ideas, which uh, are books, which leads to a varied amount of ideas for me. Um, yeah. You, you have any particular book or, or podcast that, that you always come back to like, man, that was a big game changer for me. <sighs> I mean, I can remember the most excited I was while listening to a book. Um, was one called The Great Game of Business, which is a very just ho-hum uh, title, but it's about open book management. And I can just, like, sometimes my, literally my blood pressure and pulse will increase, just not really thinking as much about the ideas, but just applying those ideas to what we specifically have going on. Yeah. Um, and it, you can just get excited sometimes. I mean, I think I'm blessed, maybe, maybe the biggest blessing of, like, whatever I'm good at is I can... I've been excited about this now for 10 years, and I think that's rare, both from like, I happen to get to work at a popsicle company, which I think is naturally pretty fun, but I don't think there's probably a lot of people that um, 
can, can kind of keep reinventing it for themselves and finding things that are interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a skill or a, just something I was born with or, or what. Well, I mean, th that can be a problem, like keeping the magic alive, yeah. even when you do initially feel passionate yeah. about it, right? Yeah. I mean, whether we're talking about personal relationships or uh, business ideas, it's hard to sustain the fun over time, yeah. right? Because we're constantly craving novelty. Yeah. How, do, how do you manage to do that? Yeah, so my, um, just like books, there's a million different personality tests. So I don't know which, which yeah. one this is, but I always remember this. I'm considered a quick start. Um, and so I don't have, I don't have, I have a very low concern with things being perfect. And if I've got an idea, I'm very comfortable just saying, hey, we're going to go with this, mm -hmm. see what happens. Uh, but I think realizing that most people aren't like that and that I will. So where I, whereas I'm excited about business and the business that we operate, I would not be an ideal accountant because I would maybe be excited about setting up the processes, but I wouldn't be excited about doing them three years later. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are people that are really good at like tweaking and, and marginally improving. And I'm usually stuck more on like, here's some new way we can approach this or something new. Um, so I think the good part of it is it keeps it interesting in my head. The bad part of it is that's not for everybody and it can make our business a little bit spastic. Mm -hmm. um, so balancing those two things is, is the problem uh, and, the, and the, I think what keeps our brand interesting. Well, how do you stay in that quick starter mode? Because usually when you initiate a process, that creates a bunch of operational details that you then have to manage and oversee. Are you just really great at delegation? How do you stay out of getting bogged down you know, in the weeds? Yeah, so when things are really small, it's really easy or easier because you've got a 20 by 10 room and you've got people crammed in it yeah. and they're just listening to you. As the organization grows, it definitely is like more of a, a go slow to go fast, I think is like the, maybe the businessy term about it. But like, if you are more thoughtful about how you're going to start something, it'll actually get implemented quicker than if I just like come back from a meeting and say, hey, we're gonna now make pops with a uh, split in half. That's a cool idea, right? Let's do it. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you explain the why, if you do all the things like, it takes maybe twice as long, 10 times as long to, to get the idea into people's heads, mm. but the actual implementation and it working is so much quicker. So uh, I guess just, I know that in my head, I don't always do it. And I think just the, the more I see it and um, success is reinforced through going slow, it, 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 it helps me to realize like my natural intuition is not correct in this. It's just, it's all right. So, so you're really big on the, the whole move fast and break things, apologize later kind of philosophy? I think I'm big on it, but have realized that it is not always the most effective. Yeah. I personally can handle it. Um, and if I, if I work on a social media campaign that gets four likes, I'm not going to get that worked up about yeah. it. I'm just like, okay, what are we going to do next? But I know there are people that will be like, oh, man, we just spent like a week on this thing and it connected with nobody. Um, and that, that can be really demoralizing. It just isn't for me. So I think as a leader in the organization, my role is now more to make sure what we're doing is um, working for more people. Maybe not everyone, but at least yeah. more people. You know, a lot of people out there feel like, Look, I get the whole thing about put your ideas out there, get feedback from reality, but can't that ruin you? So l let's say I, I want to write yeah. and, and you tell me, TK, just put your ideas out there. But the first thing I'm going to write is going to be pretty bad. Yeah. And then that's going to establish for me a reputation as being a horrible writer. And so a lot of people have a have, uh, struggle with overcoming that initial hurdle. Mm -hmm. The first, th first iteration is going to look bad. People yeah. are going to remember me for that forever. Yeah. And then I won't overcome it. W yeah. What's your take on that? Oh man, it's not that one. Mine's definitely to get it out there. So I got laid off from my job in uh, August of 2009. Mm. By the time I kind of got my stuff together, I realized not October, September, October, probably not the smartest time to open a frozen treats business. But I also knew that like I needed to put it out there eventually. So I had told myself I had April 1st of the next year, no matter what was going on, I was going to open the business. I was going to be somewhere selling pops. I didn't know how that would happen. Mm. 
kind of fast forward, a lot of my initial ideas didn't work out. I thought I was going to have a brick and mortar store. I ended up that I couldn't because I had $7,000 and the grease trap alone was going to cost twelve. dollars um, Ended up pushing myself in order to hit that deadline to have a single popsicle cart on a single corner in, in Atlanta in like the neighborhood I'm familiar with where I knew a bunch of business owners just from frequenting their businesses. Uh, the cart looked terrible. I didn't have time to rebrand it with my correct branding. Um, 95% of what you would see today wasn't there. Um, and I think if I would have waited and, until it was perfectly what I have now, first of all, we never would have gotten to where we were, where where it was. I never would have had the ideas because I needed the market to kind of tell me uh, what what was working and what wasn't. But mm. I think I would have just eventually thrown up my hands and gone to work for somebody else, and maybe that would have been okay too. But it wouldn't have been what we're, what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm firmly in the camp. Put yourself out there. Um, there's obviously a balance of like don't just publish the very first thing you write. Um, so wh whatever your process is going to be. Uh, but I think deadlines are kind of what works for me on, mm -hmm. on big projects. So if, it's a, if, I, if, we're, if we're launching a new product, like we're working on soft serve right now, we've got deadlines that we're pushing ourselves towards. And the product that we come out with at the end of that deadline might nail it or it might need, might need some work still. But the, the alternative, I think, is like you're in this incubator mode where um, you don't actually know. I don't think most people really know if an idea is good or bad. Um, I mean, this is really meta, like who's to say, but if the market is going to respond to an idea, I mm -hmm. guess, um, until it's out there. You, you, there's no computer or person that's smart enough to, to predict those type of things. You can have a $10 million budget and the most experienced executives putting out a product and it might flop or you can have somebody that's in their kitchen um, videotaping themselves and that's the next big thing so I, I just don't think there's a a direct formula that's my take yeah you know I, I saw a video once on YouTube where a lot of different artists were surveyed and there was this interesting disconnect between what they thought was their best work mm -hmm. and what was most popular among the fans yeah. And, and typically an artist is wrong about this. When yeah. they say, this is what I'm most proud of, when I die, I want to be remembered for having created this, the fans are like, oh yeah, but we love that other song that yeah. you thought was terrible. You know? <laughs> so there's kind of a presumptuousness there where yeah. when we wait, it's like, what are you waiting on? Well, you're waiting on the day when you feel like your idea is good enough and that might not agree with yeah. the market. And, and so there's no substitute for getting that feedback from reality and yeah. that takes the risk of, just making mistakes, yeah. you know, yeah. Definitely what I believe. And it, it can be scary. I mean, I, the first pops that, that I sold personally, I can still very much remember, and I still have a little bit of this feeling today, which I think is healthy, but you hand this, you, you, you get the money, you hand them the product. To this person, it's just a transaction. They transact 100 times a day or 20 times a day or three times, I don't know. Um, but those first few you sell, you're looking at this person and you're like, you're waiting for some reaction. Like, are they going to throw it away? <laughs> are they going to make a face? Are they going to come back and tell me that it's terrible? And I mean, I, that is like, it's a very real fear that I think some part of our um, body is, is is trying to avoid. I mean, it's the the fear of failure it is a real thing. But you, the more that you realize it's going to be okay, I think the more comfortable you get with it. Let's go back to 2009 when you experienced that setback. What was the idea for King of Pops right there right, waiting for you? Is it something you have been holding on to for a long time? Yeah. So as my oldest brother's anthropologist. Uh, he did his field work in different countries in Latin America. Ecuador and Panama were two that I visited when he was down there quite a lot, just kind of crashing on his couch. Yeah. Uh, but he would always take me to interesting places. Anthropologists probably are pretty good at that. They kind of are interested in interesting things. Um, but the paleta, which is the Spanish word for popsicle, is basically similar to our popsicle, but instead of artificial flavorings and colorings, it's, it's real fruit, interesting combinations. And you could find them on street corners or in like kind of like 
hipster buildings and, and everything in between. And it was just a, it was an amazing product. And we talked about how on trend that seemed like it would be back in where we were from with farmers markets and people caring more about what they're putting in their body and wanting it to have a story. So I think that idea has actually been pretty consistent. Um, when we were trying to tell people about the brand and I was trying to pick what the name was going to be, I wrote kind of a paragraph about what, what the brand was going to be and, um, or what the idea was. And I think that's still pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. um, but it just it develops, it changes, it iterates. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I guess going back to going back to those days, it's it's loosely what I thought it would be like um, as the product is, but how we would get it to the market, how people would, would connect with the brand, uh, why people would connect with the brand, I had no idea, and in a lot of ways, I'm still figuring that out. It's hard to define that. And the very first iteration, uh, you, you talked about the, uh, I believe you said cart. Yeah. And, and you said it looked terrible. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and you're just selling popsicles out of the cart. Yeah. And at this point, are you thinking this is just sort of a, a job that's going to get me through, something I want yeah. to explore? Were you thinking this is going to be big? I gave myself a year, and I told myself at the very least, I'm going to have a story to tell. That seemed like a good deal for me. Yeah. I had just gotten laid off from a giant insurance company, so nothing seemed like a sure thing, whether I was working for somebody else in a very secure industry or working for myself. It just kind of at that point, I'd lost this sense of I'm definitely going to be getting a paycheck. Um, so I'd bought a condo. I rented that out immediately when I got laid off. I moved on to my brother's couch. I started working 100% on this business. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I, I naively, I didn't think that I was coming up with the next thing I was going to spend my life working on. Yeah. Um, I, to be honest, probably didn't really even imagine that. It was fun to talk about. It was fun to go to a party and say like, yeah, I'm starting a popsicle company. And people were kind of tired of hearing about it, but um, no, I didn't. I didn't imagine that it would be much more than um, the spark of maybe something entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. um, or maybe not. Maybe just like I said, when I got older and I had grandkids or whatever, I could. I kind of envisioned myself being like, "You wouldn't believe what I did when I was twenty-five. <laughs> yeah, I started yeah. a popsicle company." <laughs> now, that's a guiding principle for me. I, I always say live for the kind of stories you yeah. want to tell, yeah. you know, at the end of your life. Yeah. You know, so let, let's go to the, you gave up the condo. And, and this was, I'm sure this was, this felt like an achievement at the time yeah. that you bought that, right? Yeah. So you let that go, you sleep on your brother's couch. How long does that period last? He had, he had all his rooms full. So when, I think it took maybe six months for his, one of his roommates got married or something yeah. and moved out. And then I moved into a bed. So I, it was, no less than four or five months, probably half yeah. a year. So um, things started to pick up pretty quickly. That wasn't really that I could afford it. He would have just not charged me. So at the time, this yeah. brother's now my business partner, uh, yeah. was a lawyer, so he was doing all right. Yeah. And he just, he, it was fun for him to kind of, he was very much a part of this nights and weekends mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Um, and when we first started, uh, I always say we, I don't know why I'm used to that. At the beginning, it was that's, me that's starting. A good habit. Yeah. That's a good habit. Yeah, it was me starting it. Uh, my friends and family and everyone were helping a lot at, at night um, and weekends and whenever they could, really. And I couldn't have done it by myself, but it wasn't like not successful. Really, I, I should take that back. By most stretch of the imagination, like I didn't really have a difficult start. I showed up one day. Few people came the first day. A few people, more people came. There was never like a moment where like I had this setback or crash. Um, it was just a steady incline until winter came, and halfway through that incline, it got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore by myself. Like as a full-time employee, yeah. I need to hire somebody. And I told my brother, I was like, it was kind of our idea. He was down on a lot of those trips with me and my other brother. Um, we can do this 50-50. I think that would be good. It'd be obviously fun. I like I like working with you. Or if you can't leave your high-paying job as a lawyer uh, right now, um, I completely understand, but I'm going to hire someone else, and that offer is kind of off the table. Uh, so he thought about it, I guess, but pretty quickly took it. Um, he has a really funny story of my dad writing a letter. My dad never 
written a handwritten letter to me. He wrote my, or I don't think anyone else since, to my brother Nick and gave it to him, like urging him to like, hey, you've worked so hard to get your law degree. You're really doing great. Do not go do this with your brother. Uh, little Don't go sell know, popsicles. He already quit it. his job, and, and uh, at that point, he just hadn't told them yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, it's kind of been history since then. I mean, we've um, we've grown every year. It's never been easy. Uh, we've always worked really hard, but I would say from a, I feel like I, I generally have a pretty optimistic view of the world, um, but we've had it. I would say pretty easy. Yeah. I mean. We've worked and, as hard as we possibly could, but haven't had these moments where, like, we had to go get um, last-minute financing to pay our employees or anything sure. like that. And, and you've grown uh, a distribution arm yeah. uh, as a result of this, right? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have, we have a handful of businesses, I think, kind of eight, all of varying sizes. Some lose money, some lose a lot of money, some make some money. Uh, but, yeah, so we were distributed by one of the big distributors, which that's kind of the dream when you get into a food brand uh, CPG space like we're in. Uh, everyone wants to blow up, be the next Super Jenny. I mean, uh, not Super Jenny, Ben and Jerry's. Yeah. Uh, and we found our product just sitting on shelves in kind of these rural areas that we weren't proud of. So our product is, is all natural, uh, which and even beyond all natural, it doesn't have emulsifiers or preservatives um, in them. So it's a very clean label, which is great, uh, but it doesn't sit well on a shelf for nine months uh, in a freezer. So we would we'd find them in these stores. The product would look not good. Uh, and we felt like not proud of that presentation. Anyone that saw it probably wasn't going to be too impressed by the brand, and certainly anyone that purchased it wasn't going to have a good experience. So we. We dialed it back, um, and instead of being in thousands and thousands of stores, we were probably in 10 to start with, and we did it ourselves. And when we, uh, when we started that process, we realized that there was probably a lot of other people that had similar frustrations with the large distribution. I mean, just the way it works. It's, it's built more for the uh, P&Gs or Cokes of the world than it is for somebody that's just starting out. And, um, we had a lot of friends from farmers markets in different places that had great products, didn't necessarily want to try to do all that. So, and we had a lot of space on our trucks. Popsicles are, don't take up a whole lot of space. So we, um, we said, hey, we're going to do this. Uh, grew it year by year. Um, really didn't want to add too many brands, but best in class food brands from the South is kind of our niche. And uh, now we're up to 40-ish brands. Uh, we sell to about probably a thousand stores, but we go to maybe five, 600 every week. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really fun and fast paced and high potential business because uh, the big guys like Whole Foods and, and even more so like Kroger and Publix and Sprouts and whatever, they're trying to differentiate themselves and they want to have these stories and these products on their mm -hmm. shelves. And then in addition to them, there's all these independence, mom and pops type stores that they don't really like dealing with a lot of the big distributors and they want these products that are of their community. So we're kind of trying to bridge that gap. Um, and much like starting the popsicle company without knowing anything, like our initial idea was 80 to 90 percent right. Um, but we've we've kind of wiggled our way into something that makes sense for us now. Well, one thing that comes up about you a lot is that on one hand, you're this really creative entrepreneur who's just always starting up stuff, but then you're also really involved in the community in yeah. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about that. Hmm. So I had a realization when I was, so I worked on the same corner, um, North Avenue, North Highland in Atlanta for three years. So basically the way we had, me and my brother had our business set up is I sat at this one cart spot and he went and kind of did everything else, whether it was catering or festivals, because mm. I really wanted to build community um, and kind of the analogy is if you're behind a counter you're behind a counter and we talk about our cart just being like placed in the community and you can come from any side or whatever it's an analogy um, but I realized pretty quickly that I was talking to people whether they were just walking to the laundromat and I was holding the door for them they got in an accident and I brought them a pop because 
they were having a bad day because they got in a car accident and I was sitting right there and I didn't have much to do. Or it was a regular that I checked in on the Braves with every day that these people um, started to want to help us whether they liked frozen sweet treats or not. And I saw how if there was a banker that was a customer of mine, that relationship when I walk in that bank is going to be a lot different, like if they actually knew us. Um, if there was somebody that was going into this laundromat every day, they never bought a product, I would find out a year later that they, they just couldn't eat sugar. But they really appreciated just the conversation of someone talking to them every day just as a regular thing. I figured if there's a way for us to expound that, um, it would be more valuable and, and truthfully just a lot more fulfilling than uh, our brand being as large as humanly possible. Um, so we decided as a company we were going to limit ourselves to the south, um, which we get calls from Chicago or New York or LA weekly, if not more, uh, to do different things. But it made it easier for us to say, no, we want to focus on deeper roots here rather than spreading this thing as wide as possible. Uh, and that's probably a lot of why we've started other businesses as well, because um, we are wanting to build a, a business. Like We think profit is great. We think that it's fun to grow. It's engaging. Like It's hard to have an employee that you care a lot about and be like, yeah, I like you a lot, but we're just happy where we are. There's no opportunity. So we want to keep creating opportunities. Um, but we think you do that through going deeper into the community. Uh, you do that through like intentional things, which are like marketing strategies, um, whether that's like a something that started as an employee benefit, which is our yoga event that's kind of big now. Um, it started it just like for five to 10 of our employees to come to because we couldn't afford like a for gym membership for everybody. Uh, now it's we're doing it in all seven of our cities. Um, Hundreds and hundreds of people come out to the one in Atlanta, up to like a thousand. Sometimes it's pretty amazing. Um, and then throughout the kingdom. And for, for me, yeah, I mean, kind of coming back to just something being fulfilling, like it's fulfilling to go to Music Midtown, which is a big music festival here in Atlanta, and sell like a ridiculous amount of pops. That's one type of fulfilling. But it's more fulfilling for me to be at the end of that yoga event when we were first starting. And Shavasana is the kind of the pose that you do at the end where you just try to stop and, and, and breathe and uh, realize that we helped to create this opportunity for hundreds of people um, that some of them have probably done yoga a lot and then other people like just happen to be walking by and they're in their jeans and they saw someone trying to explain how to do this thing and you might have introduced them to something good and even if they don't do it ever again like that one moment just felt like that's worth doing something for. So, yeah, so a lot of times I think we're trying to get we're really focused on like defining our purpose and words on a piece of paper. Um, but more often than not, it's it's a feeling um, that you have to share with people and then talk about that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, man, I mean, yeah. that, that's right on the money. A, a big part of Revolution of One, yeah. the purpose for what we do here, is is to help people overcome this tendency to, to underestimate the degree to which they as individuals can change the world. Yeah. We, we, we tend to take this approach that says, all right, um, politics is the only way. And if I got a politician in office that I don't like, I just have to wait you know, for another four years yeah. before the world can change. Yeah. And we've got 365 days of opportunity before us every single day. Yeah. We can vote in the marketplace. We can vote in, in the free market. And there are so many little things that we can do from how we treat a human being, how we develop our own potential and so forth yeah. um, that can have a radical impact. And you're giving a great example of this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I think the opportunity that we have every day can both feel, and so it's all, it's all about scale, right? And we get caught up on seeing how many followers The Rock or Kim Kardashian has mm. and think that they're the people that are making a difference. but the flip side of that is you're not connecting to whatever you see there in the same way that you will. And I believe certainly like a one-to-one -one connection, like you talked about with a person, 
um, I think we, as a, I think as a business community, are kind of too focused on uh, marketing metrics, which are which are a good like maybe good one of five things to look at. But like I said before, like a one to one conversation with the right with someone at a popsicle cart where you're talking to them and connecting with them will make like a lifetime of a difference. Whereas the best social media post you can probably ever come up with will probably make a one minute of difference. Like at most they might share it and which can be valuable, like it and talk to whoever's in the five feet around them. But I mean, I've seen so many times whether it's like us going to a wedding or a bar mitzvah and we do like one little extra thing that people just aren't used to brands doing. Um, mm -hmm. Like the father of the bride tells us something special and we make a flavor based on that or we write something on the board in a special way and like people literally don't forget that. And um, you can be doing it kind of for both reasons. Like you can feel kind of like we're doing this for business reasons of like, this is smart business for us to do this, but also it is so much more rewarding and fulfilling for the, the vendors, we call them slinger, that's out there getting to create that moment than just showing up, handing out the pops and leaving. Like It feels good to create happiness for people and that's one of the things we try to provide that opportunity. I mean, it's our AC in our trucks is broken way too often, so I hear about it. It's <laughs> hot outside. Like it is not an easy job to go out there and like smile at people for ten hours on your feet. Yeah. But you do get these opportunities where it's like either someone's having a bad day and you can kind of flip it a little bit, or someone is celebrating something so cool and you can like help them remember it in a more special way. Um, and that's special. It's really it's really cool to get to do that. I'm glad to hear you say all this too because. I feel like the, the reputation of the businessman, you know, um, it, it's a common trope when you when you watch television, when you watch movies, to to paint the picture of this money grubbing materialist. It's profit, 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 yeah. you know, um, and you're painting a different picture, yeah. you know, um, and, and it's an inspiration for many people who say, well, I, well, I have these creative ideas, but yeah. I, but I, I don't want to be that you know, that trope that I see on yeah. television, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you make money to be able to do those things and to be able to pay people. And if you feel bad about it, then it's gonna be, it's gonna be a less fun journey. Like, you can't feel bad about yeah. it. It has to be kind of part of, part of what you're doing. And, and hopefully it's not everything that you're doing, um, but it, it allows you to do what you wanna do. Whatever your purpose is, whatever your, your kind of goals are. Like, I don't think your purpose Personally, I don't think your purpose should be to, to make money or make profit. Um, and I don't think that is good for like a whatever the era we're in business. I don't think people respond very well to that. But um, it has to be a part of it because if you don't like selling things, you're not going to, you're not, <laughs> you're not going to get to do what you love. And I think there's other opportunities to do it. Like yeah. it could be, you can work at uh, a, a bank and, and I think that's a, a good career and maybe not be as engaged in what their, what their purpose is. And then when you go home, that's where you, where you kind of invest. It's just, this is just one way to do it is, is through your, your work. Yeah. You know, the, the way I like to think of it is you, you cannot help other people create uh, wealth or success from a place of despising those things in yeah. your own life, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm going to give you a gift, yeah. it must be a gift that I don't disparage, yeah. right? I, I've, I've got to cherish it and say, I'm giving you something that's yeah. valuable, yeah. you know, um, okay. as opposed to I'm giving you something that I yeah. personally think is evil and that I should feel guilty yeah. forever thinking about. Yeah. yeah. We started this interview talking about your reputation for generating ideas and, and you said something right away. You said you found out that it's less about coming up with an idea and it's more about executing the idea. For people out there listening who feel like, man, I had an idea like that to come up with a popsicle stand, but I just didn't have the money. Yeah. Or I have creative ideas all the time, but I don't know anybody that can put me on the map. Yeah. What advice would you give to people on becoming a better executor of their ideas? Yes, I think there's two things. I think you need to get from people that have a lot of ideas, you need to get them out of your head because when you forget them, um, you think like, You'll, you'll marinate on it and you'll be like, I forgot like the world's greatest idea. So I have a practice of just writing everything down um, 
David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, is a recommendation for that. And I think that's probably part of why there's the 100 ideas thing, because for a long time I've just written down yeah. every idea, whether it's good, bad, whatever. Um, but then the, the execution part, I mean, my advice would be to, it depends on the scale. I mean, if it's just you, I rely a lot on deadlines and um, probably somebody to help hold you accountable. If you're, if you're not a part of a company, I think you need that. Like, if I would have made the deadline and told nobody, I could have probably just scooted on by. But I told my family, I told my friends, I posted it on the internet. Um, and so I, I, I figured out a way, even though as a company of one, to hold myself accountable. Um, so I think that's a good piece of advice. And then once you start working on the idea, I think it's the, I think, it, I mean, the best ideas are simple, right? So it's like, don't try to figure out everything, I guess is a piece of advice. It's like, it, it is hard to kind of comprehend it. I, I struggle with it all the time yeah. because I'll sit there and the best use of time would be for me to write out where we are as our business, a two page plan, and then go present that to the 10 people that it's gonna most impact mm -hmm. and say, pick that apart. And I love to do that and I do it maybe 5% of the time. More often than not, um, what we'll do is like kind of some little offshoot, we'll test it and maybe it'll kind of work or maybe not. But for me, getting things out of your head is good. Um, it's another simple idea, but just once you have them out of your head, um, you prioritize. If there's a next action, you, you do that next action. I mean, he preaches a lot. David Allen preaches a lot about um, if you can do something in two minutes, just do it. Yeah. If you need to map something, then map it. Like spending time ma mapping things is a really easy, uh, it's a really easy thing for people to avoid, um, but is valuable. And then next action step, I mean, it's all basic stuff, but yeah. It takes, once you get in the habit of doing it, which I'm, to be honest, not 100% in the habit, but I, I can tell it works when I do it, and then I'll fall back into my ways of not doing it and just feeling that sense of overwhelm. Yeah, you know, I, I second the, uh, the David Allen getting things done recommendation. One of the ways I like to think about it is, all right, if you write things down, you, you, you do a better job at remembering them, but you also do a better job at coming up with more of them in the future. Yeah. It's kind of like your, your mind won't trust you with creative ideas yeah. if you don't do the right things yeah. with them. Like eventually it'll say, all right, you're not gonna execute these. <laughs> um, David Allen says, he says, uh, the mind is for having ideas, not holding them. Yep. And, when, and when you're spending a lot of resources holding on yep. to them, then you compromise your ability yep. to have them. So yep. it's, a, it's a tool for, a lot of people just kind of dismiss it as a tool for organization, yeah. but organization facilitates creativity. Yeah, I keep I wake my fiance up a lot because I'll be laying in bed and I'll have an idea and I'll be like, oh gosh, and I'll just have to get, <laughs> I have to get my phone and I just I put like nine words down, which 50-50, they make sense the next morning when I get up. But it, it it allows me first to go back to sleep without just like stewing over something, and then it, sometimes it's some good stuff, so it's cool. Yeah. Well, well, I hope our, our, our viewers have been taking notes during this uh, yeah. this episode, man. You shared a lot of great ideas. And I appreciate you stopping you. by, man. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. Appreciate it. Thanks for checking out this week's episode. If you'd like to know more about this week's guest, Stephen Kars, you can go to Instagram.com slash King of Pops. And if you're interested in having King of Pops at your next event, be sure to check them out at KingofPops.com. Also, follow us on Instagram at Instagram.com slash online. Subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash fee online. Be sure to go to the website fee.org slash rev1 for articles, weekly motivational Monday videos, and our monthly YouTube videos. And lastly, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play, and make sure you leave a review. Thank you. See you next time.